in the previous video we saw what are missing values and what are the types of missingness and then based on that what we can do either we can delete or we can input in this video lecture we will see what are outliers some details of outliers some details of encoding techniques and some details of scaling that is data transformation to start with what is outlier what are the types of outlier we will understand what are outliers outliers are generally classified using three categories one is global outlier collective outlier and contextual outlier global outlier are these are the simplest form of outliers in the given data set a data point strongly deviates from all the data or the rest of the data points it is called global outliers so you can take this example so this can be outlier it's clearly evident a student writes all his exams in right hand in one instance we get it as left hand so there is a chance that this can be an outlier because of some error in data taking this is one of the example of global outlier global outlier is easy to find now there is something called collective outlier some of the data points as a whole deviate significantly from the rest of the data set these are called collective outliers say for example in this case this is a set of data which is actually an outlier now these are the set of data points as a whole which deviate significantly from rest of the data set you can see the figure and you can make out this is called collective outlier now one more type is contextual outlier this is one of the examples of contextual outlier what is contextual outlier data obtained deviates significantly from other data point based on the specific context or conditions only for example in northern hemisphere summer starts in may and you want to observe a value corresponding to that with respect to the temperature so you can see there is a sudden drop in june instead of somewhere around here this is here so you can make out based on the context that this is an inconsistent data and it's an outlier so this is called contextual outlier so we learned three types of outlier one is global outlier this is the example of global outlier and collective outlier where a group of data points deviate significantly and third one is a contextual outlier based on the context we can make out there is a inconsistency in the data how to identify the outlier one of the ways to identify the outlier is using box plots this is an example of box plot so we have a minimum value we have a maximum value and we have a median from that we will have third quartile and the first quartile the entire range between third and the first quartile is intra quartile range i will not go through the formula of how to calculate the box plot i assume that you already know that because it's already discussed in the previous lectures i will take an example now we have six instances 1 to 6 are the values now if i represent the same in the box plot it looks like this here 0 is the minimum value this is the minimum value and this is the maximum value 6 is the maximum value which is the this part now the median is 3 this is 3 corresponds to 3 and the third quartile range is 4.5 and the first quartile range is 1.5 now similarly you can do it for few other cases like this is one set of data this is second set of data and this is third set of data you can pause the video and you can solve it and you can find out which one is the outlier among the three sets now we will discuss each in detail we have the data 0 to 6 in this case so as you can see 0 is the minimum number and 6 is the maximum number since most of them are 6 so the box plot looks like this if you apply the formula and calculate 3 will be the median and it will go till 6 and 0 is the minimum value the quartile range is 1.5 to 6 that is the third quartile is 6 and the first quartile is 1.5 now we'll go to the second case in the second case so we have 0 to 9 again 0 is the minimum number and 9 is the maximum number this is 9 now we have the median which is 3 and then we have 4.5 and we have 1.5 as the first quartile and the third quartile you can see that the entire data is represented within the box plot if you up, when you apply the formula when you apply the formula so and the entire data falls under the box plot now let us consider the third case is it an outlier is any data present in this set is an outlier we will see so if i plot it 
we see that there is one point which is an outlier which is nothing but 10. Now 10 is an outlier and it has plotted the data with respect to 0 to 5. 0 is the minimum value and 5 is the maximum value and the median is around 3 and then the third quartile range is 4.5 or something and the first quartile range is above 1. So now 10 is an outlier. How did it get? How to calculate it is? You just take the intraquartile range. How to calculate the intraquartile range is? This is the third quadrant. This is the first quadrant. You take the values 4.5 and 1.5. You will get the range that is 3. Now you got the value 3. From that you will multiply by 1.5. You will get 4.5. So if you add 4.5 from the third quartile range, it goes till 9. So it goes till 9. You can see here. So that's why the previous data which contained 9 even it plotted in the within the box plot. Here it plotted outside this plot. Why? Because it's an outlier. It is above the range of 9. Similarly, an outlier can exist even below. This is also possible. This is one case. This is this case is also possible. One of the ways to find is actually using the box plots. So if you want to find an outlier using a box plot, this is one of the method where you can plot it and see. And then based on that, you can see what is the outlier. Now, we will go ahead and understand what is categorical data. Now, there are two types of data, quantitative data and qualitative data. Quantitative data are numerical and qualitative data are actually generally strings or some categories. Now, the qualitative data, which is a categorical data, can be divided into nominal and ordinal. What do you mean by nominal and what do you mean by ordinal? Nominal are just categories and they don't have an order. Ordinal are actually categories, but they have an implied order in it. In quantitative data, we have numerical data. It can be either discrete or continuous. Discrete some numbers, continuous is any numerical value. This you already know. Now coming to the categorical data. So you know that this is divided into some categories which are generally represented in strings. Now, how does the computer will understand this? Do you have to convert this to a numerical format for better processing? What is ordinal data? Ordinal data are the categories which have an inherent order. For example, educational qualification like high school, masters, bachelors, PhD. So, there is an order. So, if the order also as a feature we should consider in our model, then it falls under ordinal. Now there are some classification like animals. You are doing a classification of lion, tiger, cats, dogs and so on. So if you are doing that, there is no inherent order as such. In that case, we can use nominal, nominal categorization. Okay. Now how to convert the given data into a numerical format so that the method uses it to perform some processing. So this type of conversion is called encoding categorical data. Categorical encoding is a process where we transform the categorical data into numerical data. That is called encoding categorical data. Now why is it important? The performance of a machine learning model not only depends on the model and the hyperparameters but also on how we process and feed different types of variables to the model. Since most machine learning method only accept numerical variables and hence pre-processing the categorical variable becomes a very necessary step. This is the main reason why we do the encoding. Now there are various ways in which we can do the encoding. We will learn only few ways. The first one is label encoding or the ordinal encoding. As the name suggests, it is for the ordinal categorical data. Ordinal categorical data, you know that these are the categories that have an inherent order. You have primary school, then high school, then bachelors, then masters, maybe after that some PhD. So there is an inherent order in it. So if there is an inherent order and if you are using it in your data, then it is better to do ordinal encoding, which is also known as label encoding. So what we do here? We just convert the given data into some integer values. High school is 2, primary school is 1, masters is 4, bachelors is 3. So this type of conversion is called label encoding or the ordinal encoding. This is very easy and it's very informative as well. Now the question is, since it is very easy, 
can we do this for the categorical variable which is nominal can we use this label encoding for a categorical variable which is nominal in nature or which is non ordinal so if it is a nominal data can i apply label encoding the answer is no why because it will give an order so if you are classifying into cats and dogs and then if you are using label encoding one is superior over the other that is what it conveys so if we don't want to do that generally we don't use the label encoding now what to do in that case there are various algorithms there are various encoding techniques which are used for the nominal data but we will discuss a few the first one is one hot encoding what is one hot encoding do is let us take this example origin which contains usa japan europe 3 now since we are not worried about the ordinal ordinality here it is just an information so if you are classifying this type of data a nominal data we can convert this into some columns so now we have three distinct categories so we will put three column and we will do it so usa is 100 japan is 010 and europe is 001 so now if you change this say for example for usa if you give 001 and japan same as 010 and europe as 100 still it works okay just that you have to give it three distinct numbers if there are three categories you will use three columns 100 010 and 001 the order can be anything so you can give japan 100 europe 010 and usa 001 it will not matter this order will not matter so how many categories are there that many columns you will get create and you will fill so how how it happens is in one hot encoding for each level of a categorical feature we create a new variable each variable is mapped to a binary value binary variable containing either 0 or 1 here 0 represents the absence and 1 represents the presence of a category that's all okay what is the demerit of one hot encoding so there are two one is it introduces the sparsity in the data set another one is it creates dummy features in the data set without adding much information which is called dummy variable trap so what do you mean by that so to understand that we will see this so if you want to classify all the living organisms present on earth so we will consider all the class labels and you want to consider this and do the classification that is your problem now if you want to do that this n is very huge and if you apply one hot encoding you will have n columns the problem with this is you will have very little ones you have too many zeros so this is called dummy variable trap so it increases it introduces a sparsity in the data set so when you have a, this type of data where the categories are very huge in that case generally we avoid using one hot encoding what can we use there are various other methods as well so i will be discussing binary encoding binary encoding is a mixture of hash and one hot encoding what it does is you have n categories from n categories first you will convert into some integer value so here we have hot cold very hot and warm and it's get repeated so there are four now i will convert it into some numeric value numeric integer value from that i will convert it to binary so once i convert it to the binary then that binary value is converted to the one hot encoding now you can see 001 010 is represented as it is but 3 is represented using 011 so 011 so this type of encoding is called binary encoding it's not just directly converting into the binary format uh, that will not reduce the complexity it will be just if it is n then it will be just n minus 1 so this will not do much if you directly convert just to the binary so that's why we use binary encoding which does both hash and one hot where we convert it to integer value then convert to the binary from binary we convert it to the one hot encoding so this is called binary encoding we will go to the next topic that is data data transformation so you are transforming the given data into something else okay one of the best examples is data scaling how are you doing the data scaling to understand that we need to understand why actually we have to do the data scaling so data in the sense the attributes attributes values are there so we use the word feature attributes and features are close if 
an attribute which is actually significantly contributing to something we call it feature significant contributing attribute is nothing but a feature this is used in general there are various definition for that as well so now why you have to do the a change in the attribute why you have to do some scaling why you have to transform something in the attribute or the obtained value is the question let us take this example data preprocessing course we have a data preprocessing course which is given for adults let us say then the age group will be 27 to 50 and then we have time spent how much time they spend to learn this course and what is the difficulty level of the course all the course lectures are converted into some difficulty level like easy medium and hard or easy intermediate and expert some three class levels are there now from this you have to see what is the result so is there any correlation among the result or not that if you want to check so you cannot apply directly to this method why because age ranges between 27 to 50 now what is the time spent time spent is represented in seconds 48 second is approximately some 13 hours 13 point some hours and 83 is approximately like 23 hours some learner has used around 13 hours to complete some learners have used around 23 hours to complete now this is a huge amount of data 48k and 83k is very huge compared to the age similarly it is very huge compared to the three different class levels of difficulty level easy medium hard or easy intermediate and expert novice intermediate and expert so now how to do this most of the machine learning methods uses distance metrics to measure in their computation now if it uses such sort of thing all these variables will not be of significant impact it only considers the time spent we have to normalize this type of data in such a way that all the attributes contributes equally that is why feature scaling or the data scaling is required now how to do feature scaling before that you need to know that there are few algorithms which does not use the distance metrics in that case you can directly use it you need not do the feature scaling but most of the algorithms use actually distance based metrics to do some analysis in their methods so in that cases we have to do the feature scaling now how to do feature scaling we can do it in two ways one is normalization another one is standardization what is what is normalization or min max scaling normalization is also called min max scaling so we just take the value and we know the minimum and the maximum values based on that we will generate a new value so it will create the data within a range this is min max scaling now what is standardization scoring it uses mean and standard deviation to calculate the new value this is the formula for that so we can use normalization or standardization based on our requirement based on the requirement of the data now what are the differences in normalization and standardization there are quite a bit of differences normalization has a minimum and maximum value of features that are used for scaling standardization as per the definition it uses mean and standard deviation normalization is used when the features are on different scales but the standardization is used when we want to ensure zero mean or unit standard deviation and also normalization always scales between a range that range you can define or based on what you require we can specify so it always scales between the range but here it is a not bounded to any certain range the standardization if you do not do outlier detection and all those things in your uh, pre processing steps generally it is not recommended to use the normalization it's always better to use the standardization techniques now it is useful when we do not know the distribution the normalization is always useful when we do not know the distribution but in standardization if it falls under normal or gaussian then we can directly use the standardization there is a other name as well the standardization is also called z score normalization whereas the normalization is called scaling normalization these are the few points on the scaling with this i want to conclude this video by telling some of the open ended question should we always scale our features is the question one of the answers i already told you if your method is not dependent on a, some distance metric then it is not required to use some scaling techniques that is one apart from that are there any reasons where we need not use the scaling the second question is is there any single best scaling technique and the third question is how different scaling techniques affect different classifiers and the fourth question is should we consider scaling technique as an important hyperparameter of a model we discussed hyperparameter before 
I assumed that um, or else we will be discussing it again. Now the thing is these set of questions are valid for each and every step of data preprocessing. What we mean by that is for missing values or data cleaning, reduction or anything, any major task in subtasks like missing values. So uh, do you really need to scale? Do you really need to fill the missing value? Is there any single best method to do that? How different techniques are used and how it affects a different classifiers and how this matters as a hyperparameter for doing the classification. Similarly, you can map to all the concepts which we learned including encoding, outlier detection and all those things and you can try to understand how best we can find a solution for a given set of problem. If you try to answer this question, you will get some idea about what are the best ways to handle this, what are the various ways available and what is the best for your data or the your problem statement. These are the few set of sources where I took the data for my lecture videos. Now to summarize, we have what are the types of data, global data, collective data and the contextual data. These are the three types of data and we saw what are the differences and what are the definitions. Among them, we are tried to understand how to find an outlier using a box plot. With just a box plot, whether we can find an outlier or not. After that, we try to understand why there is a need to do the data encoding. In data encoding, we have numerical data and also categorical data. Then we saw what is categorical data encoding. In that, we saw there are two types of data. One is qualitative, another one is quantitative. One has only numbers and another one has strings or categories. When you have categories, you need to convert the categories into some numbers. That is called categorical encoding. In categorical encoding, there are two types. One is for the data which has nominal and another one is the data which has ordinal in nature. Now the data which are nominal in nature, for them we have to use some one-hot encoding or the binary encoding. For ordinal in nature, we have to do label or ordinal encoding. Ordinal encoding are those which has an inherent order and nominal encoding data is for those data which does not have an inherent order. For those type of data, we saw what is one-hot encoding. In one-hot encoding, we saw the sparsity of the data. The data can be sparse if it is too large, then too many zeros will be there, then ones. So in that case, we may not use this. So we used binary, binary encoding. Binary encoding is a mixture of two different encoding techniques. And then there we saw that it is converted to some integer value, then binary value, and then it is converted to one-hot encoding. So this is, these are the two ways. So these are the two ways we do for nominal data. Now after that we saw one aspect of data transformation that is scaling. Scaling can be done using normalization and standardization. Both has its own merits and demerits based on the data or the requirement we will choose whether which scaling method is used. There are chances that even scaling may not be required. In that cases we do not use the scaling. To summarize the entire lecture on data preprocessing, we learned at an abstract level what is data processing, what are the types of data processing that is data preprocessing and data postprocessing. And also we saw why there is a need to do the data preprocessing. We understood few complexity issues like time complexity, space complexity, whether it makes an efficient algorithm or a method or not, what is the effectiveness of a problem, how errors are there and how errors are handled. And also we saw what are the major tasks in data preprocessing such as data cleaning, data integration, data reduction and data transformation. Also we saw in detail what are the types of missing values, types of missing less also we saw about missing values, what is missing values, why missing values will occur and what are the types of missingness, MNAR missing not at random, MAR missing at random, MCR missing completely at random. So if it is missing completely at random, we can directly delete it. For these two cases, we have to do some imputation or we have to collect the data in a better way. Also we understand what is outlier, what are the types of outlier, global, collective and contextual outliers. And we saw box plot, how box plot is used to detect an outlier. And also we saw all the categorical data needs to be converted to the numerical format. And to convert that, we have categorical data encoding. In that. There are two types of categorical variables, one is nominal and then one is ordinal. For nominal, we have various methods like one-hot encoding, binary encoding and so on. And for ordinal, the most popular one is ordinal encoding or the label encoding. So ordinal encoding, when you have an inherent order, in that case you will just encode it by converting it to an integer value. And then we have 
one hot and binary encoding as well for the nominal data. After that, we saw one of the aspects of data transformation. In data transformation, we saw what is scaling. In scaling, there are two methods, standardization and normalization. In this video lecture, we saw only the some basic concepts of data preprocessing and an abstract level why data preprocessing is required. It is not an in-depth study of why data processing is required and what are the various steps involved and for each type of data, what are the various methods available for data preprocessing. I hope you enjoyed the videos. In case of any queries, let me know. Thank you.